Well, welcome once again. We're so excited to have you with us here on our online services. I just kind of wanted to kick off uh, because we're in a transition weekend again today, and uh, we're excited about this because we're now we're transitioning to having both online services and back on campuses services. And so we're really excited to be doing this transition, but I just wanted to kind of bring you up to speed because over the next few weeks, you might see that our online services look a little bit different. And that is really because we're going to be shifting eventually into uh, not pre-recorded services, but uh, live services. So you're going to be part of one of our live services in the upcoming future. What that means is we're not going to be able to do all the editing that we normally do in a service. So right now we put in all of the lyrics for the songs right at the bottom so you can sing along with us. Uh, we also put in all the scripture verses so that you can read right along with us. Uh, you have my full attention. I'm looking just at the camera because there's no congregation to look at right now. But when we go to live services. I won't be looking at the camera as much because I'll be looking at the congregation that's present in the building. So uh, I want to give you just a heads up about some changes that will be happening and it'll, it'll just be happening because it'll just enhance the way we're doing service. But whether you're online watching us or on campus with us, we are so excited to have you with us um, because we just are grateful that God has given us the opportunity to connect with you and to minister with you online. We just are believing God's going to do some incredible things uh, through both online ministry and on-campus ministry. So thank you for being a part of it. Uh, today, I want to take a pause from our Following Jesus series. Uh, we're going to get back into it, and we're going to look at some more, uh, about three or four more ch uh, chapters or passages in the book of Mark, but I wanted to just take a moment and pause because so much has been going on around us and, and really has been impacting us, and I have just been kind of praying a lot because honestly, uh, I've been a little frustrated because I, I really look and look and I, w I wish I had a substantial answer to everything that's been going on, and I just don't. I'm just being honest. I don't see a direct answer to fix everything that's been going on around us. And um, I, I think maybe many of us feel the same way. We're, we're frustrated because we feel like that. And so I, I just want to be a little transparent with you that I just have turned to prayer because that frustration really has just grown because I hear all the screams and the shouts of the, all of the things that we could possibly be doing. But if, if you really look at what they're saying, it never changes anything. And my heartbeat is I don't want to be going through this again six months, a year, two years down the road. I mean, we've been crying for change and wanting to see change happen. And, and that's the desire of so many people. And yet... We, we never seem to make too much progress. And so again, I've turned to prayer, asking God what he wants. And what I realized about myself is a truth that I believe is probably evident in your life as well, if you're humble enough to receive it. And it really is this truth because I'm frustrated because I don't have all the answers. And the reason why I don't have all the answers is because my view of everything that's going on in the world, in our communities around us, is very limited and very short-sighted based on just through my lens and what I can see. And so I have to acknowledge that, guess what? I don't have all the facts. And you don't have all the facts. And I certainly don't know what's in the heart of other people, whether it's police officers, rioters, looters, you know, or anybody else. I realize, though, this. God has put these limits in my life for a reason. And he's put it there really to tell me that I'm not God. And guess what? You're not God either. And this is why God says we don't have a right to really judge one another and to go after one another on these things. Because when we do that, we're acting like we are God, that we have the ability to know all the facts and everything that's going on within each other's lives. And if, at the end of the day, if we're really honest with ourselves, I know for me, 
I can barely juggle all the things that are going on in my life and the motives and the reasons why I do what I do. And so where I find myself is really back in God's word. Because guess what? I have a commitment in my life to live by his word. And whenever his word points to me to do something, I do my best to try to align myself with God and his word. And I believe if you're a believer today, you want to do this as well. And so Psalm 119, I was reading today, Psalm 119, 2 verse 3, or 2 through 3 says this, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. They also do no iniquity, and they walk in his ways. And if you know me, you know that I desire to serve God with my whole heart. And I know that means that if I'm successful at that, I will do no wrong to those around me. And I will walk in his ways. And if you're a Christian today, that should be your heartbeat. That you, your whole heart desire, your whole drive is to honor God, to give him your whole heart, to live fully for him. And if you do that, and as you practice that, you won't do wrong. And you will find yourself walking in his ways. God has his word. It has some powerful things to teach us, some powerful ways of living that we're going to look at today and how we treat one another. And so as we kind of get into this today, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews chapter 13. And I I want us to look at the verses between verses 1 and 8, and we're just going to pull out some insights from them. But before we do that, would you just pray with me? Jesus, we open our hearts up to you, God. Because, Lord, we see a world that is hurting in so many ways. In our lives, in our hearts, we're hurting in many ways as well. God, we need repentance. We need healing uh, to flow to our lives and to our hearts. And so I pray that as we read your word and as believers, you would help us to step into what these words are saying, to live them out and to see the power behind following your ways. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said this before, but we don't know exactly uh, just what everyone's going through. And so we're going to jump in, and we're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. And when you look at Hebrews, we actually don't know who wrote the book, but uh, we know a lot about the book of Hebrews. If you read it, it is a book filled with walking by faith and not by sight. I mean, there's a whole chapter dedicated to living by faith. And as we come to chapter 13, the writer of Hebrews is getting ready to wrap this book up. And uh, this is the last chapter of the book. And if you know about endings, you kind of want to leave with a bang. So these are like the high points of what the author wants us to remember as we leave this book and get back to life. And so this is why it's very important. And look what it starts off with in verse 1. It says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Listen, one of the things I love about our church is that we are a diverse church. I mean, you look around and you see people of, of many different colors and races. And, and I really love that about our church. And one of the reasons why I love that about our church is because it is a reflection of what the family of God looks like. And I believe if the family of God looks a certain way, guess what? The church should look that way as well. And so it just really, really warms my heart to know that we have a diverse congregation. But let me just tell you something about families. Families, you don't stay together as a family just because you're family. I mean, look at biological families. Look at how they operate. I mean, so many families, they're, they're per, many of you, your personal family stories is that there's all kinds of fractures and you're not together, you're not unified. Why? Well, for some of you, it's a matter of divorce. You know, a divorce happened, uh, the f- husband and wife split up, and, and so it fractured the family, and so the family is no longer together. For many of you, you have kids that have just kind of went off and done their own thing and have fractured your family and, and, and you're not together anymore. Some of you, you, you really you just don't get along with your parents. Like you guys just cannot get along. And so there's these fractures. And so what, what my point is in bringing all that up is to point out the fact that just because your family doesn't mean you stick together. And many of us were experiencing 
the, the fraction of what happens when, when people go their own way. And what the, a word that encompasses all of what goes on in families is this word sin, okay? That word sin comes in and it really messes up families. All of these forces are simplified into that one word sin. You know, what, it's what happens. Now listen, the difference between families that stick together and those that are torn apart is not that families that stick together have no sin in their midst. It really has to do with the fact that they have a higher goal. A higher goal of loving one another, of forgiving one another, of reconciliation, of working through tough circumstances. Instead of cutting and running you, you have a higher goal to push through and to preserve the family. And so that's what gets you through these tough circumstances. As a church family, you and I, we must remain committed to each other and to love one another no matter what comes our way. Because guess what? Satan would like nothing more than to drive a wedge between the body of Christ. Let me show you what's at stake if he does this, though. If we don't obey God's word and, and we just kind of cut and run from one another and go to our corners and do our own things and separate ourselves, this is what's at stake. And it's vital for us to understand this. Sec or 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, and then I'm just going to skip over to verse 14. It says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And I want to make sure that you don't really miss this because when you become a Christian, when you've come into the family of God, guess what? You become part of that body. And the one thing that you see throughout 1 Corinthians 12 is that a hand cannot say to a foot, I don't need you. Because if you chop off that foot, guess what? You're going to be hobbling around, okay? And, and this is what ends up happening. When the body of Christ starts separating itself from one another and we start cutting pr people off from one aspect or another, we end up damaging the body of Christ. And we end up not looking the way we should look. We are disfiguring the body of Christ when we do this. And Satan wants nothing more than to disfigure the body of Christ. But we're called to a higher standard. We're called to be very intentional about loving each other just as Christ loved us. And so the very first thing that we're told here in Hebrews chapter 13 is, is we have to be intentional about loving our brothers and sisters. Now how that looks is something we, we're going to look at today as well because I mean, we could say we love each other, but what does that really look like? First, let me ask you a question. I want you to just think about this. How have you been suffering this week? Because I believe every one of us, I don't care who you are, everything that's gone around us has touched us in some way, shape, or form. And we've all suffered in some ways. Some of us have lost sleep. You know, some of us have just been emotionally tore up over the events that have gone on. Some of us are in fear. I mean, there's all kinds of emotions that have gone on this week because of the suffering that's gone on around us. And so here's what we're told in verse 3. And it's a very challenging verse in light of everything that's going on. But, but I want you to look at this and then we're going to unpack it. Hebrews 13, 3, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. Now here's, here's the key. Look at this very closely. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Did you get that? Have you seen people being mistreated this last week? I mean, let's unpack this because this has incredible weight to us. For me personally, over the last few months, I've been praying a prayer, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I just want to have a more of a pliable heart for the things of God. And, and so I've been praying this prayer. And, and then I come across this verse and it kind of spells out something that breaks God's heart. And Personally, I haven't really been doing what this verse says. And, and my guess is that most of us haven't. But the people I see being mistreated around me, 
this verse says, I need to suffer with them as I have been mistreated in the same way. Do you get that? And I think there's two reasons, two main reasons why we don't do this. Why I haven't done this. And the very first reason is that I tend to use all my energy to avoid suffering. I mean, you know what I'm saying here? Like, I don't, like, go around looking to find reasons to suffer. Uh, As a Christian, I think most of us, we know that suffering comes our way, and we know we need to endure suffering. But very few of us actually sign up on the dotted line to find suffering and find new ways to suffer with those around us. And here God is telling us very specifically that you and I are to intentionally intentionally suffer with those who are being mistreated. And as Christians, as hard as it might be for us to intentionally step into suffering, this is exactly what Jesus came to this earth and did. He stepped into the suffering of this world. And he suffered for this world. And so in essence, Jesus is calling us to this same type of thing. And so the first challenge is is to step into suffering and not to avoid it. But the second challenge is really a big part of this as well, because guess what? If we're going to step into another person's suffering, then we're going to have to become aware of the things that they are suffering with. And how are they being mistreated? Let me use two examples that are going on right now. Right now, a lot of African Americans around us have They've, it hasn't just happened just now, but it's been going on. But they've been mistreated by so many people in our country and in this world. And, and they're going through those mistreatments on a daily basis. But just as much as they're being mistreated, there's another group of people that are greatly being mistreated as well, and that is police officers. The men and women that are serving to protect Um, to protect our communities. They're being targeted and mistreated in many ways. And both are being mistreated really because of a lot of ways being typecast. And so this is what's really going on right now. And I want us to really walk through this. And I want to be clear as we dive into this that I don't really care how the reasons that are motivating the world around us. Because as Christians, we're called to act differently. And if the one way of, of acting differently is, is, is that it's do things God's way, I want you to understand that God's way is normally way harder than the way the world's acting. Otherwise, everyone else would be doing what Jesus did. The fact of the matter is, is we don't do what Jesus did because so often it is hard. And so let me just start off by just talking a little personally here. First of all, I'm white. (laughs) Just in case you didn't know, uh, I want to point out the fact that I'm white. And so I wanted to clear that up before we move on. But let me just tell you a little bit about myself because you might not know this about me. I actually know quite a bit about the African American community. In Bible college, I was an urban ministries major, specifically focused on working in the inner cities. Um, I also have a degree in sociology, and I was three credits shy from having a minor in African-American studies. And so I understand and know the history of African-Americans in, a great detail, in great detail, probably better than the average person out there. Um, but it goes beyond even just studying about the African-American community. I spent a great deal of time in ministry in these communities as well. And in some ways, outside of ministry, because I rehabbed houses in places like Inglewood and the west side of Chicago. And so I was in these communities very often. I also have ministered side by side by many African Americans. In fact, I'm uh, the best man in a wedding of a friend of mine who's getting married this summer who's an African-American minister, and I'm excited to stand up for him in his wedding and be there with him. One of my favorite memories is going into the inner city. Remember uh, when the Robert Taylor homes were up? I I went in and was part of a group that went in and ministered in in those uh, buildings there, and we would set up up speakers, and we'd do kids' ministry out there. 
And there's this one time where we were out there ministering to kids and they were doing their things and I had, I had a kid on my shoulders and we were just singing worship songs and then I put him down and pick up another kid and he would be on my shoulders. And as that was happening, I was being pelted with rocks. And I kept being pelted with rocks and I just kept kind of ignoring it and picking up more kids and changing them out every so often. And, uh, and then I look and out of the corner of my eye, I see the kid who's been throwing rocks at me the whole time. And I didn't realize that this whole time, guess what? He was just trying to get my attention because he wanted to turn. And it really taught me a lesson of how we can misjudge things. Because what I thought was, here I'm being pelted by rocks, someone's trying to hurt me. When the reality of it was, was I was being pelted by rocks and a kid desperately wanted my attention. I mean, do you see how we can misjudge things so easily? And yet, it's a critical mistake if we fall into those judgments. Now, I'm not telling you these stories to prop myself up in any way. I'm telling you these stories because as much as I'm aware of the things that go on in the African-American community, I still have no clue what it is to walk as an African-American through this life. And so I've been spending time simply asking people that I know are African-Americans what they're going through, what they're experiencing, because there's no way that I can suffer as they're suffering without asking them what they're going through. And I'm just encouraging you today to step back and to really really spend time asking and, and trying to find out what are you suffering because you're never going to be able to truly suffer as those that are being mistreated are being suffered if you have no idea what they're going through. I was talking to one of the ladies in our church today and she was talking about how her little boy right now um, is cute and so for the most part nobody really gives him a hard time but someday he's going to get older and he's not going to be so cute she said. <laughs> And people are going to judge him. And that scares her. It's a scare, a fear that I never will probably have with my son Levi. But it's a very real fear that this family has for their son as he grows up in a community that looks differently upon black children than they do white children. And so how can we really step across and see what people are really going through, our brothers and sisters in Christ are even going through during this time. I'll flip the script because some of us, again, it's a police officer. We have no idea the things that they've suffered, how they've been mistreated this week. And maybe for you, you need to call somebody who is a police officer and you need to listen to their story or their heart of what they're going through. Because I have a friend who I was watching this week their feed go, because while their husband was out on patrol through the night, while all the chaos was going on, she couldn't sleep. And her kids couldn't sleep wondering what was going on and if their husband and father would be able to come home that night. That's what many people very really uh, went through this week. And my point is, is that we're called as Christians to not allow our biases to get in the way, but instead to go, you know, as a Christian, Jesus told me this, God told me that I am to look at those that are being mistreated and I'm supposed to feel their pain and suffer with them as they're suffering with them. And my question today is, is what would a church that does that look like? What if we set aside all of our biases, all the things that we could be arguing and pointing fingers left and right up and down, all around it, everybody and anything, and it doesn't solve a thing. But what if we did it God's way and we truly stepped into feeling? I'm not talking about intellectually figuring out, but feeling the suffering that each other is going through. Because that's what the scripture is teaching us. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 26 goes on to say, if one part suffers, Every part suffers with it. Is that the church today? Are we suffering with one part of a body that's suffering right now? 
Can we really say that? Because that's what scripture calls us to. That's the standard. And that's the part that I want to step into and walk through is suffering with my brothers and sisters as they're suffering and facing and what they're going through in life. Now before we close, there are three promises we can hold on to as we step into loving and suffering as God has called us to suffer. And here's the first one. Look at verse 5. It says, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Listen, what I want you to understand is, is that God has promises for us when we do things His way. And whenever we step into suffering because God has sent us there to suffer with somebody, what I want you to find out is that God shows up every single time. The people that suffer for God, they experience God in new ways. I think of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stood up and did what God had told them to do. They did what was right. They stood up for justice and to honoring God in his name. And guess what? When they were thrown into the fire and they were supposed to go through the suffering and the affliction of the fire, what they encountered was God in a fresh way. And what I want to tell you right now is that if you will choose to step into the suffering that God has called you to, for the people that God has called you to love and suffer with, what you're going to find is not suffering. You're going to find God in the middle of the fire. And he's going to be there to, uh, to really help you and to, and to help you through it and, and to give you a blessing instead of a curse. See, what we find when we do things God's way is we find God. And so you may not be able to wrap your mind on how suffering is going to draw you closer to God or why you should do it. But what God is going to do is he's going to answer the prayer I've been praying, break my heart for what breaks yours. And what I'm going to find is I'm closer to God's heart than ever before when I choose to suffer as God has called us to suffer. Now look at the second verse that I want to bring up. Hebrews 13, 6 says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I shall not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And I know one of the motivations that keeps us from suffering with people is really this idea of self-preservation. And what I have found out to be true is that whenever I go to where God sends me, He protects me. I have some incredible experiences of, of just being in some of the most dangerous circumstances that I should not have been in. In the middle of the night, in project areas, but there because I'm there to minister to a youth and serve God. And where there should have been fear, there was absolutely no fear because I knew God was with me. And honestly, I often realized, and I just thought this, it was my time to go. What can mere mortals do to me? If they kill me, they didn't take my life. They, I have life. I have life eternal because of God. And what you find is, is that when you step into doing the will of God, fear dissipates. Perfect love casts out all fear, right? And so what we find is not fear but in fact, a confidence in God. Because what can mere mortals do to us? And so don't let fear hamper you from doing what God has called you to do. Because the only way I know that that fear goes, that you know that that fear is not there, is to step into the fire and just have all and only God to cling to. And you know there's no fear in it. The third promise is this. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You might be asking, what is the big promise to hang on here? And I would say this, if there's one thing we know about Jesus, it's that he broke down barriers everywhere he went. I mean, he went to the Samaritans who Jews rejected and they literally would avoid them at all costs. Instead, he went directly into the center of their lives. He elevated women who often were put down or not respected as much as men. And he elevated them. We already talked about how he often would go to the lepers that everyone would avoid because they literally would scream out, unclean, unclean, and everybody would flee 
from these people, but Jesus, not him, he would go to them. He would touch them. He would heal them because he broke down barriers. He broke down walls. And if Jesus, if the promise is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we know that Jesus broke down barriers and walls, then if we're to walk as Jesus walked, guess what that means we're to be doing today? Breaking down barriers and walls. And we're called to live out this promise. To practice the way that Jesus lived. And that promise is still something that God wants to do today. As we close today, we're really faced with a choice. It's the same choice as we're faced with really every week, and that is this. You've made it this far, so you've heard the word of God. But literally, you could turn off your TV or your computer and walk away and just do life the way you've been doing it. Or we could begin to align ourselves to change and do what God's word tells us to do. And I want to tell you this. We need to be very intentional about keeping our family together, the body of Christ, loving one another. But I was reminded this week of something very important by another African-American lady who just simply said this, you know what, Pastor Kevin? Truthfully, we come together in church. We love one another. We're friendly with each other. But when worship ends, we all go home to our different neighborhoods. And we pretty much do life on our own, not connected as much to one another. And that really can be the reality for a lot of us. We live in our little world, they live in their little worlds, and our worlds intersect only on Sundays or only on Wednesdays, and that's it. But I really believe God's called us to do life at a higher level than even just that. He's called us to do more than just tolerate one another, more than us just to be semi-interested in one another's lives, but to truly love each other. Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes that means weeping with one another, feeling the pain that one another is going through. And I believe that's the time we're in right now. And we're not to go to our own corners, but we're to really feel what we're going through. What would happen if we didn't love from a distance and we truly began to feel the things that each other are really suffering right now? That's really the heart of today's message. What would happen if we did that? You know, honestly, I hope to hear that there are many phone calls that happen this week that many of us were checking up and asking one another, what are you going through? Because I want to suffer. I want to know the things that break your heart because I want them to break mine. We're in this together. We're all sons and daughters of God. And if that is the reality and that is the truth and we truly believe that, when one part of the body suffers, we should all feel that pain in ourselves. And so many of us, we have to be intentional on picking up the phone and calling one of our African-American brothers or sisters or calling a police officer or calling somebody else we know that is suffering this week so that we can begin to walk through their suffering with them as God intends us to. Because I'll tell you, one of the things about the body of Christ is that we don't do life alone. We do life together. We care for one another, and we honor one another above, really, ourselves. Because that's what Jesus called us to. And so I believe the church has a way and an opportunity to lead the way here and to really make a difference in loving one another and showing that there is something different amongst Christians than there is in the rest of the world because we do life the way God told us to do it. And we come together and we love one another and serve one another and weep with one another. Would you bow with me and pray? Jesus, I pray for every person today, God. I pray especially for our African-American brothers and sisters who are going through incredible things this week, God. Their hearts are broken in so many ways. 
Lord, of, of just seeing another life lost, of seeing the destruction around us, Lord. And Lord, I just pray for healing, God. I pray that real, real healing would take place, not only in their personal lives, but God, God in our land. Lord, I pray against the sin of racism, God. I pray that, Lord, you would just, anytime we diminish somebody for some reason, that there's no reason, God, to do it. And Lord, it is sin. And I pray, Lord, may you root that out of our country and of our lives in any shape it might show up in, God. God, I pray for our police officers. God, those that are been in harm's way and, and really have been, Lord, the, the target of outrage, of anger, but Lord, it really hasn't been fair. And may we suffer with those who are suffering, holding that line, Lord, to protect our communities. And God, may once again you bring healing to our land and our hearts, God. And I just thank you for that grace and that mercy. And we just, we just Lord, receive you and the grace you have for us. Before we go into a time of worship, let me just ask you this. Maybe... Maybe you've really been hurt in life right now and really you understand that Christianity does have a higher standard and that Jesus has a better way. And maybe you just realize today that you want to step into what it means to be a follower of Christ, to love as he loves. Really, you have to understand that without God, you are away from him and you need a savior. And you yourself are not perfect all of us have sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of god and therefore we all need a savior and if you recognize that today that you're a sinner in need of a savior i just want to ask you would you pray with me to receive jesus as your lord and savior and to dedicate your life to following him from this day forward that's what you would you pray with me jesus i confess i'm a sinner lord i've done so many things wrong in my life but I thank you that Jesus came and died on the cross for my sins and he is the savior that I need. And so God, right now I receive you as my Lord and savior from this day forward. Lord, may my life never be the same again. And I thank you for your spirit coming to live inside of me and to help me do the things that you do. Lord, thank you and empower me by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that, would you just let us know? We want to pray with you. We want to uh, give you a Bible and help you in your next steps in following God. So reach out to us. Let's go to Lord and worship, and then we're going to come back for a time of communion.